Good morning, Fort Smith. It is the August 3rd, 2023 Parking, Traffic, and Safety Committee meeting. And would you please call the roll? Mary Lou McElwain. Here. Steve Pesci. Here. Mark Syracusa. Here. Harold Whitehouse. Erica Wygonek. Here. Deputy Police Chief Mike Maloney. Here. Fire Chief Bill McQuillan. Public Works Director Peter Rice. Here. Stephanie Casella, Planning Department. Here. Chairman Andrew Bagley. Here. Thank you. And if we could have the financial report. to accept the report second any discussion and I'll just comment I believe this is the first time our revenues have exceeded uh, 10 million dollars on an annual basis and you know that's a result of, of efficient and professional expertise in the parking department so I just want to acknowledge that and uh, all those in favor uh, Aye. I, I, <laughs> who are you looking to Ben and next uh, we have public comment so it just feel free to come up to the mic, uh, state your name and address, and, and yeah, let us know what you're thinking. Because obviously I have to go back to work. Yeah, of course. Um, Francesca Marconi Fernald, I uh, reside at 1000 Maplewood Avenue, have a business at 177 Mechanic Street. Um, I just want to do quickly two issues. South End Parking Enforcement, thank you. It's hard to regulate stupid parking, but we have to try. Uh, my employees and fishermen have been uh, carpooling this summer to try to alleviate some of these issues as well as parking on Pierce Island. I would say about half of my customers are pedestrian, scooter, or bicycle, the other half drive. <coughs> Personally, I've got eight parking spots in my lot. I don't expect enforcement to ne negatively affect my business. Number two, my favorite one, camper vans. This is not a homeless issue in the South End and Pierce Island neighborhood. I'm not against camper van parking. We just need to give them a designated spot, not on the neighborhood streets. I've seen a marked increase in the camper since COVID. They've begun to overrun Pierce Island. I have photos from, this is just Tuesday morning. There were 13 of them there. Right, I counted them too. Um, lost my spot. They began at uh, 13. I've kept a loose log um, since April of a daily log of how many campers have come and gone there. It's, it's too much. Um, I was on the Pierce Island Committee for several years because I wanted to make sure that the island was preserved for recreational use, not overuse. It's getting overused for free camping with a lot of abuse, trash, dog poop, and now human waste. Um, the boat launch has posted no overnight parking or you'll be towed. Other signs at the park have the hours posted as sunrise to 11 p.m. June 1 to October 1 and then sunrise to 7 p.m. October 2 to May 31, um, they're not enforced. I, I don't know why. They used to be, but they're not now. Um, if it's not enforced, excuse me, if these parking things are enforced, it will push the campers back into the neighborhood streets. So let's find a spot to put the campers not on the streets. They're taking up too much needed parking as it is. If you're going to allow this to continue, you must put some regulations on camping citywide. Example, camping in designated areas, maybe May 1 to October 1, that's it, charge for it, no camping after that. If a resident needs to park their camper out front of their home for loading, cleaning, seasonal put away, give them a free resident parking permit, good for 24 or 48 hours, make it free. I'm almost positive that the money collected from camping will offset any additional seasonal employee or two that you're going to have to hire. Um, and I please try to address this issue this year so that it doesn't become a giant problem next year. I know I know everyone's working on it, and I thank you. I'm just going to leave my photos for you. Thank you, Francesca. Absolutely. And could you pull the microphone just a little closer for you for the next speakers? I don't know if that's, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, I don't know Thank if it's been picked time. up or not. Thank you. I saw this the other night. I counted 13. Uh, Good morning, Tuesday everyone. Morning, uh, Justin Richardson, 586 Woodbury Avenue. Um, I, I guess the first thing I want to say before I forget is uh, 
thank you for all the work everyone's been doing on Woodbury Avenue. I live over by the intersection near Edmond, and um, I, I remember thinking at the time when the uh, traffic control measures or speed measures were put in place, the speed humps or cushions, I think they're called, my, my first reaction the next day was like I'd been living next to a dangerous criminal for the last seven years, and all of a sudden they moved away, and and it felt safe to be out on the street again. I mean, it was really, um, it was unbelievable. Um, the 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 difference in the feeling uh, that that occurred on the street. Um, you know, that said, the, 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 the measures that are out there on a trial basis um, aren't perfect, so I want to give some of my comments, but in the spirit of saying, hey, you know, we're really headed in the right direction, uh, maybe some adjustments can make this better. Um, I think the current um, cushions are too high. Um, what, what's happening is, is I know the target is to get something that people can drive over at 25 miles per hour. When you look at what people are doing, there's a lot of confusion. They're slowing down to 5 or 10 miles per hour. And there's also an aggressive response to that by not every driver, but I would say about 1 in 10. You know, they're, they're punching it. You know, they're going right up to 50 as if to say, to heck with you, um, traffic control measures. Um, and, and I think... I think, uh, you know, when you look at what happens on Maplewood with the speed uh, tables that they have, you don't necessarily see that type of aggressive reaction. You do see a slowing down and a speeding up, but it's a more uh, reasonable approach. And, and I think that um, I'm not saying we have to go to speed tables, um, but I do have some thoughts on that. But I think what's there, there needs to be more measures in place. Obviously, we're just doing it on a trial basis now, but make them uh, less restrictive so that you don't have the congestion there, which brings, to my, brings me to my next point. I know one of the goals in these was to have um, something that the emergency response folks could go over at high speeds, and I've seen um, the ambulances go by a couple times in the last month couldn't get a good look at it from my house, but what I notice is is that they have to slow way down. Um, they can't avoid the um, cushions the way it's intended because the cars are stacked up on them because they back up at these things as the cars go from you know 25, 30, 35, whatever they're driving to trying to going over them at 10. Um, that makes a situation where there's no room for the uh, certainly a fire truck or an ambulance if they can even do that to 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 adjust maybe it would be better with a slightly reduced height uh, speed cushion because there'd be fewer cars backed up at them I think that you you, you the, the more of these you put out the better um, so um, that, that's important um, I know they were pulled out um, I think on Monday this week um, it was immediately back to the same way traffic has always been. I mean, I, I know that I think the data showed a 38 uh, mile per hour, 85th percentile speed. I mean, it's right back at that. I mean, I, I look at it and I can't believe it's 38 miles an hour on most of them. I think part of the problem, too, is when I pull out of my driveway, I'm not worried about the average speed or even the 85th percentile speed because about one in six or one in seven cars are going above that, and those are the ones that scare you. I mean, what makes you afraid of are the people that are the extreme drivers. Um, so that's why I think more bumps are, are needed. But um, you know, let, let's, let's keep doing the work that we're doing. Thank you, and I hope these comments are helpful. Great. Thank you, Justin. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Liza Hewitt. I live at 726 Middle Road. The pilot program in Middle Road succeeded in lowering speeds by using a variety of traffic calming measures. So imagine my surprise when during last month's PTS meeting, between the time I left to attend the meeting and the time I returned home, the speed indicators on Middle Road had been removed. Removing 
the speed indicator signs were never once mentioned as an important move towards calming traffic on Middle Road. I understand they are expensive. I could understand if they needed to be rotated around town. However, there are many speed indicators that appear to be permanent, such as on Banfield Road and Maplewood Avenue, and others that have been in place for a long time, such as the multiple indicators that are out here on South Street. Speed indicators appeared to be an important component, along with the lowering of the speed limit to 25 miles per hour and lowering the overall speed on this dangerous road. I am concerned that the removal of the speed indicators has again increased the speed on Middle Road over the last month since they were removed. I would ask that whoever decided to remove the speed indicators on Middle Road reconsider that decision. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liza. Good morning. I'm Kathleen Bodock. I live at 34 Hunking Street in the south end of Portsmouth. I'm here just to echo Francesca's concerns about the RVs in the area. Um, and also to support the, what I saw the photographs of the parking on Pickering Street, Pickering Avenue, uh, Mechanic Street, that there's a real concern there for safety, uh, not allowing uh, emergency, the space for emergency vehicles to get through. There's no way a, a fire truck could get around those corners these times with the parking as, as it is right now. <coughs> so I just want to say we're very concerned about that kind of element. We are an aging population in that area, and we sometimes see the need for emergency vehicles. So. We appreciate some care for that area. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you, Kathleen. Not Francesca, she's not aging. <laughs> My apologies. That was funny. Um, Page Trace, 27 Hancock Street. Um, I'd like to first say to Assistant Police Chief Mahoney that thank you very much for all that you've done in the last couple of weeks in conjunction with Peter Rice and in conjunction with yesterday. Um, you were obviously spread pretty thin yesterday, and yet the police managed to move traffic along on Middle Street at the same time that they had a major investigation down off of State and Daniel. Um, that said, I'm also going to, sir, admit that I'm probably one of those people headed out of town on Middle Road, that that traffic speed sign helped to remind me I shouldn't need it all the time. I do know that the speed is 25 miles per hour. But on that occasion that you're not really thinking and you're headed out to Route 95 or something else and you have a fairly long trip, you might occasionally go above 25 miles per hour, and I realize that that's of concern to um, Mrs. Hewitt. So I would ask that if you can't keep the speed sign there, that there be something else that mitigates the speed of people going out on to 33, where there's a transition from the inner city out to Pease or wherever else. That, that speed sign just helped. I would also say in conjunction with um, Mrs. Marconi's, or Mrs. Fernald's, sorry, um, Mrs. Fernald's comments, um, it's been a problem. Campers have been a problem all over town this summer. Whether it's traffic on Mechanic Street, whether it's someone abusing our hospitality up on Gate Street, which was fairly disgusting by the time I heard it. Um, Gate Street is a tiny street. It's a residential street. It, it suffers the same issues of being narrow. There's a lot of construction going on. And to put a camper and a sprinter together on that same street is bad enough. I can only imagine what it causes, would cause on garbage day, let alone emergency vehicles. So there has to be some reasonable process that will take into consideration the width of a street. And that needs to be very clear because people pay taxes for their properties and they expect 
a reasonable sense of security when it comes to emergency vehicles coming to take care of them being stopped by a sprinter and a camper on a narrow street. I would also suggest that while Ben Fletcher is a fabulous employee and knows how to make the trains run on time, sir, um, the fact of the matter is the increase in revenue is also due to the increased parking space behind the McIntyre. Um, there is no question of that. Um, it's obviously well used on a weekend or on an evening. That is the place that fills up the most quickly and people can find it. So Peter, thank you for um, <coughs> managing and Ben managing that so well because people like that and it's popular. But I'm under no aspersion as to why we have increased revenues despite the fact that High Hanover is under construction. Um, and I'd also just, again, like to reiterate, the camper situation is out of control. There has to be a happy medium, and this city has not done very much to mitigate the problem. People are suffering down in the South End and on Mechanic Street, and that's wrong. That's, it's wrong just to ignore it, and maybe it'll go away. It won't. So please do something. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Paige. And I, I just want to comment that the McIntyre revenue is not included in our financial report because it goes into a separate account that has something to do with the federal government and the Yeah, the they, that any we revenues have. generated from the McIntyre have to be spent on the McIntyre. So they're so just all the maintenance costs associated with operating it, uh, which the city is responsible for, such as heating, air conditioning, uh, fire suppression, all that stuff is covered by those costs, by the revenues generated. <laughs> and I don't believe they're captured. Uh, Director Fletcher might be able to speak to that, but they're not captured in our financial I, report. Then I would suggest, in all due respect, that the McIntyre is listed separately as a parking revenue, even though it goes separately into. That should be transparent to the people of Portsmouth. Um, sure. I realize that you're absolutely correct. The, the leasing agreement with McIntyre states that all revenues will be developed and used towards the upkeep of the building, but that should be publicly. Sure, sure, we can, we can add a line, I think. Thank you. Thank you. And I forgot, do we have anybody on Zoom? Uh, yes, Kelly Shaw. Uh, go ahead, Kelly. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Hi, it's Kelly Shaw. A um, couple of things I'm just going to continually speak about because of um, 375 Banfield Road and for the traffic speeding on Banfield Road. Again, it's not, the traffic has gotten really heavy. I counted 40 cars at four o'clock yesterday when I tried to get in my driveway. Uh, I checked the license plates. There were a few from Massachusetts, but primarily it is just cut through traffic again. Uh, Water Country's hours are 10 to 5 now, so, and it was, it's been a beautiful day out, beautiful week, so I can't attribute it to that. Um, part of the problem, I think, is with the signage, and we had two coach buses speed down Banfield Road um, the other day, which was Water Country, and they had to use their jack brake. Um, because they were speeding so fast they couldn't stop in time to get to the speed hump. Um, and the perpetual 45 mile an hour um, trucks coming on our road. I know I am just noise on this and I know that the police are doing everything they can. However, I think we need more signage to perhaps on Constitution Banfield and Heritage to say trucks right hand turn only because we have a truck and bus travel ordinance, Article 7, 7.701, where traffic, truck traffic, or 702 track traffic is prohibited and it shall be unlawful for any truck with a box, body, or platform over 12 feet in length to use the following streets subject to the exceptions of 7.704 of this article 
which number two is Banfield Road. Um, my bigger concern, and it says, and then 7.702 says, exceptions are when you're gonna conduct business um, or emergency vehicles, public utilities, um, and when they're just making a residential delivery. My concern is 375 Banfield Road, which they're talking about tractor trailer trucks coming in and out of there, 25 of them twice a day. So that's 50 trips of trucks, tractor trailer trucks. And I think that we need better signage. I mean, we can't, I, I can't ignore the progress because it's in an industrial zone. However, it, it conflicts with what's allowed on Banfield Road. These aren't the industrial parks and this Banfield Road isn't old anymore. It's becoming a, a major thoroughfare, is a major thoroughfare. And I think we need better signage in order to um, mitigate this, um, to uh, say, you know, trucks can only go this way or that way. We have signage at um, Peverly Hill Road and Morona Road and Banfield Road to say, you know, Route 1 traffic go this way. We have a little bit of signage on Ocean. I am going to call the DOT to see if we can get better signage to say, you know, Route 1 is ahead so that traffic will continue on Ocean and go out to Route 1. Um, it's a major problem. It's getting worse and worse, and I just don't know what to do. Thank you for everything everyone does for the city. I appreciate it. Thank you, Kelly. Is that for Zoom? Yep. All right, oh. with, oh, with one more. Yes, Denise Todd. Uh, Denise Todd, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I'm Denise Todd. I live at 254 South Street in Portsmouth. And I wanted to just say something about one of your items that was um, already filed uh, after I emailed Eric on the issue, and that is the um, pedestrian flashing light that you were debating installing on Lafayette Road where it meets Greenland Avenue. And I think um, this is a very busy section of the road between um, the South Street traffic light and the Route 1 bypass. Um, where children are always crossing, especially for the high school, but um, there are a few neighborhoods on the, the west side of the um, Greenland Avenue that use this um, crosswalk a lot, um, including three of my grandchildren that live there. And I cross the, um, the crosswalk there many times and the issue seems to be more coming from the South Street traffic light goes um, down the hill towards the Route 1 bypass. And the, the people coming from that direction have already been stopped at the South Street light. So they're um, putting their foot basically down on the, the gas pedal to because they've been probably stopped at the light. And then they're also going down the hill. And when there are smaller children trying to cross that crosswalk, they're not seen at all until the cars come over the hill where the street meets Greenland Avenue. Um, so nobody stops from that direction, basically. So you've got to wait until there's a major um, gap in the traffic, hopefully. Um, and I feel that a flashing light there would be um, quite sig significantly higher than an adult, um, let alone a child. And the flashing light would be seen way sooner than a child trying to cross the street there. So um, I, I would like to see the, the um, option to put that flashing light there open again and instead of just filed for some other time. 
I think it's the street is only getting busier, like every single street in Portsmouth. And I think you do a great job of trying to manage every street and everybody's concerns. But I think that's a big one, especially with it being so close to a school. I understand there's a there's a traffic light right by the entrance to the high school, but if you're coming from the other direction or the the t the city the center of the city direction, the children cross at the first crossing and they don't go all the way and wait for the um, basically the traffic to stop at the other stoplight. So it is used probably more during school times, but I know we use it a lot to bring the, the grandchildren back to our house on their bikes and we're often waiting there. And you know, I'm an adult, so, um, and I, I wait till it's safe to cross. Um, when you've got children in tow, um, I think it's quite a big concern. And I just think the height of those flashing lights um, on the crosswalks um, are so much more visible than a smaller child. And um, I just wanted to bring that up today and I appreciate you um, considering that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Denise. Mm, is that <coughs> yes. All right, and with that, I'll close the com public comment. Uh, we don't have any presentations today, so new business, uh, Sagamore Avenue, request for bicycle lane markings and no parking on both sides from Shaw Road to Wentworth House Road by Seacoast Area Bicycle Riders, and a sample motion would be moved to refer to staff for evaluation and report back. So moved. Is that a motion? Second. Any discussion? Just, just a quick comment. This was brought up prior to the golden egg being demolished, right? And yes. then we were going to bring this back up again, depending on what was going to happen at that site. Mm -hmm. So I think it's time. I hope it happens. Okay. Real concern for bikers. I do that route too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Old business. Uh, Marcy Street concerns regarding the speeding between Straight Street and Pleasant Street and a crosswalk and intersection safety at Court Street by residents. Sample motion, move to install pedestrian warning signs at Court Street. And I don't know if you have a, uh, any data you wanna to show to the yes, committee? Yes, we, we do have, we've um, done some data recording out there along Marcy Street in a couple of different locations as shown on this diagram. Um, this area here is, is near um, uh, Prescott Park. The Court Street is here to the left and this is Mechanic Street out to Pierce Island. And then we also recorded speeds in this area coming down the hill from the Meeting House Hill Road towards Mechanic Street. And what we've seen for speed data is on these sheets here. Um, average speed, 18 miles per hour. This is the one near uh, Prescott Park, Strawberry Bank. Average speeds of 18, 85th percentile, 22. And then the other section up, going up the hill, down the hill, it's a little bit faster. Average speeds of 20 and 24, 85th percentile. So the speeds are right about, the average speeds are at or below the posted speed limit of 20 miles per hour. You do get some faster traffic coming down, down that hill towards Mechanic Street. Uh, so and it, it is a uh, high pedestrian area. And we've been monitoring the, the pedestrian activity out there, you know, especially when you have activities at the park or, or this past weekend, you know, the sale Portsmouth. Um, so the, the, what the issue is, is the, uh, at the intersection with Court Street, you do have on-street parking on either side of the intersection. That limits visibility coming in out of Court Street and for pedestrians crossing the, the street. However, the parking is within ordinance of 20 feet to the intersection. So um, the only way to improve sight lines at this location really would be to remove parking on one or both sides of the intersection. There is one warning sign on this side of the intersection for pedestrians. It, it needs to be updated. We could add additional pedestrian warning signs in this area just to and, you know, alert drivers to the fact that it's pedestrians. I think anyone who drives along here will see that there's plenty of pedestrian activity, uh, but we could reinforce that with more warning signs for pedestrians. But speed does not seem an issue. I, I would recommend if speed was an issue, we could put a speed feedback sign out there, but we're not showing, you know, speeds well over the speed limit. It's not one of these areas where we're getting a lot of speeding, but there is a lot of traffic. A lot of turning movements, pedestrian activity, there is a lot of conflicts. Okay, thank you. Is there any, oh, I guess we have a, don't have a motion on the table. So the sample motion would be to move to install pedestrian warning signs at Court Street. So moved. 
<clears throat> Just need a second. Okay. Okay. Steve? Just the discussion. I, I really think we need to be judicious about signage and warning signs and speed feedback signs unless there really is a demonstrated need. I think, Eric, the thing that you just said that really struck me is most people driving through here are, are very aware that this is a high pedestrian environment. I mean, you, you cannot drive through that corridor without realizing that there's a high level of pedestrian activity and you drive cautiously and I think the speed data reflects that. So I would be really judicious about new signs, feedback monitors, plus this is the heart of our historic district and cluttering it up with signage I don't think benefits the city. Mr. Chair, yes. I would just encourage you, whatever signage we do put up, we need to be just cognizant of um, panel trucks. Um, yeah. The overhang onto the roadway, it's a very narrow roadway. Trucks oftentimes get pushed up under curbs um, and the signs get destroyed on a regular basis. So it just, you know, whatever we do, I, I concur with Steve, be judicious. Um, you know, it, it's, it is challenging, um, but, you know, pedestrians also have to take responsibility too and pay attention. But. So I, I will. Uh, mentioned some feedback I did get from one of the residents that requested this. They were more concerned with the Meeting House Hill section than they were where we would be proposing to put up a sign. So I'm not sensing that there's a lot of support to put up the pedestrian sign, or am I, do I have that correct? incorrect? Erica? I, I feel like the bigger issue here is the narrowness of the sidewalks, which is something that I think is a lot harder problem to solve. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like drivers do drive pretty aggressively given the nature of the environment. The speed data isn't showing that they're exceeding the speed limit per se, but um, it feels, doesn't feel great, but I'm not sure what a good solution would be. Wider sidewalks would be great, but I, you know, that's, it's not, We'd have to we move houses, I think. Right. Yeah, that's a, Or that's make a, it one way. Yeah. Mary Lou? Thank you. Can we make the sidewalks, the crosswalks more visible? We, we could um, make them wider, you know, longer, to, so they're more visible to, to uh -huh. drive. We talked up. about uh, changing from white stripes to color mm -hmm. years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that, Peter? I, I do. It's not, it uh, doesn't mean, uh, I mean, do you, do you, I, I mean, you well, you see it in a lot of towns. We changed that. Uh, not there's yet, like but there, there's just a report that came out last week on the use of colored sidewalk crosswalks, and I haven't had a chance to review that. The first thing it says in the report is, although this is not an officially accepted standard, some cities have been doing it. Yeah. So I need to look into that and see what how they've been able to do that and what yeah. the requirements are to do City that. City of Lebanon just installed a bunch of. It was a work in progress, and the intermediate was not very attractive. I think they're landing on something that's a little bit better, but it, you, that would be someone you could reach out to. For, yeah. yeah. I think I, 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 from an operational standpoint, I would argue against it. We have a hard enough time keeping up with the, the crosswalks that we have now, and adding additional colors will just make it that much more difficult. So oh. I, would, I would not be supportive of this. <laughs> Steve. Well. I, I'm struggling to recall. Are those continental uh, bars, or we just have perpendicular parallel lines? The ones that are on Marcy Street, as you can see in this diagram, they are the continental, okay. the latter type. The, yep. Yeah. Uh, th those are known as high visibility crosswalks. Yep. And, uh, and for the record, I think Portsmouth does a great job of keeping the crosswalks Striping. striped and painted, and the quality of the paint is good as well. Mark. I, and I t disagree with Peter when it comes to the colors. You're just going to get that's going to be an end of being an aesthetic, personal choice, too. You start with this, it's going to turn into <laughs> multicolors and political, and it's going to be a, a lot of focus on it. And the DP, DPW needs to just put down these lines and not worry about what color we pick in and not worry about the politics behind it. It's a nice idea, and some people feel maybe like in celebration of a certain event or something, but even that. I, I am not supportive of it, um, and I it was will, just. I will continue to reiterate that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, That's fine. I'm just saying, you know, we have a hard enough time maintaining what it. we have. Yeah, we talked about that before yeah. years ago. We we brought it. So circling back, 
Yeah. Oh, okay, go ahead. I was just going to say that the pedestrians coming from Prescott Park are oblivious to traffic. They just come right across. So if there can be a warning sign right there at the uh, exit entrance to Prescott Park, that might make a difference. Uh, they, they just walk across. Yeah. Warning the pedestrians or warning the drivers? Warning the pedestrians. <laughs> okay. Both ways. I just, Good luck, right? I just got a Mark. comment. I'm going to refer to Steve when it comes to UNH, when you have all that influx of traffic after classes. How does UNH deal with that, what she's talking about? <laughs> We've done a really example. good job of, of working on jaywalking on Main Street, but we do have some areas where we have ballers with chains to channelize pedestrians to the legal crosswalk. Just a few spots, but yeah. you know that's something to maybe consider. I don't think we have the sidewalk width though to do it. That's the problem. Yeah, could be in the park. I think that starts to open up a yeah. much yeah. bigger discussion. Yeah. Let's okay. circle back because we don't want to okay. take too long. So I kind of feel that from the feedback I've heard, at least from residents, that the Mean House Hill side is really more of a concern than the court mm. um, intersection. So the question on the table is, do we want to put this pedestrian sign up or not? Erica. Um, I, I don't want to open a really big can of worms, but I don't know to what extent Eric and Stephanie, you guys have kind of looked at this corridor in general for pedestrians. I mean, is there room to, I don't, I mean, I don't know what options we have. We're not rebuilding Marcy Street anytime soon, as far as I know. You'd have uh, to create a yield um, situation for oncoming traffic in order to widen those sidewalks. I mean, they're currently challenging when you have a wide vehicle, two wide vehicles crossing. Yeah. You're already clipping the, the utility poles on a regular basis. Right. Um, so, you know, short of creating a yield um, situation or one way, I don't see us being able to increase the sidewalk widths. Yeah. Nice. I guess I'm, I'm thinking just more comprehensive, like making some observations, seeing where the pedestrian problems are. I, I, I'm not sure signs at Court Street are going to help, so I, I, I don't think it's necessarily a good use right now, but I feel like it might be helpful to get just a better sense. And I, I guess, Eric, oh, you had speed signs, not counting. You don't have video there, so we don't have we, observations. We do have video. We, we just got that in yesterday. Okay. I didn't have it ready for the packet, but... It just might be interesting to see, are we seeing close calls? Are they in, all in the same area? Are there places more on the Meeting House Hill end that we see? You know, I, I, I guess it'd be nice to have a bigger picture of what's going on to see what it, we anecdotally, can do. Anecdotally, it, it's the curve coming onto Pleasant Street. Yeah. And it is the backside near Karen Buffard's house where there's a utility pole those are the two pinch points that typically you see conflict perhaps we could amend the motion to reevaluate again at next week's meet our next month's meeting <coughs> and just have a little further discussion on sure we can look more closely at that section with based on the feedback that we had in discussion today because I don't think we anybody's got a magic solution that they're ready to propose so that's Just a motion? To, so what's your motion? Uh, I guess we would rescind the motion and then make a new motion to uh, continue the discussion at the next PTS meeting. But I think Second. Did Steve make the motion? No. Okay. I forgot. Mary Lou. Yeah, Mary I did. Lou. Oh, so you just rescind your motion. Yep. And then, so I rescind your, my motion and I'll add yours. And then make um, mine, I guess. To come back at the next meeting. Okay. And then a second. Just a second, yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, second is Lafayette Road, request for a rectangular rapid flashing beacon at Crosswalk near Greenleaf Avenue by resident. Uh, sample motion is to place on file. And I think, Eric, you have a... Uh, yes, we looked at this. I didn't realize, but a couple of years ago, this was brought to the committee with the same request, and it was tabled at that time until the intersection of Greenleaf Ave and Lafayette Road would be redesigned, reconstructed, so we could have a comprehensive solution for this intersection. Um, again, so we did go out and, and use a video camera at this location to see what kind of activity is there is right now I and mean, obviously it's not school season but the most pedestrians we saw at one time was five crossing in one hour um, you know the, the sight lines are limited but you can see we do have signs at either end side, side of the uh, crosswalk as well as the weeble in the middle of the road to bring attention to it um, you know they, they don't have flashing lights but that would be the next step it's it doesn't 
under its current use in the summertime, it certainly doesn't meet the threshold of having enough activity to warrant those lights. Although, you know, it's, it is a tough road to cross for pedestrians. Um, further down, there is the uh, signal at the high school, and, and we do know that a lot of people use a, a cut through, a path through the uh, private property down there to get to the signal to get to the high school. That doesn't help people who are crossing and trying to go into town on this at this location. But uh, maybe you know a comprehensive look at this intersection, teeing it off. You know, may, who knows? If th there may be a better way, better place for this crosswalk if we were to reconstruct this and build a sidewalk on the other side of the road of Greenleaf, where they could cross at a better spot. So that's why at this point, because it was tabled in the past and, and we're not seeing the volumes that would meet the threshold for a flashing light, I have as a recommendation to just continue to table the item until further re reconstruction. Erica? Um, uh, I guess, number one, can we recount when school's back in season? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I mean, I know you can do that, but I'll say it. <laughs> um, do we have a timeline for what the intersection reconstruction might be? I mean, is this in the next couple years? Is it 10 years out? Is it? I believe it. Is it in the CIP that we have it? We, the, the next Sorry. intersection that we're, we're working on is the Miller Ave um, intersection. But that's more of a signalization mm -hmm. uh, project. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, we have had a public meeting relative to this intersection. There was a mixed um, feedback in terms of what folks wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't a clear path forward. Um, Looking at you know, it. It, it is a it is a high concern. Although given you know its awkwardness, it really you know knock on wood, I haven't. We don't see the numbers. Um, of accidents that I would I would have thought there would be a lot more accidents in this intersection. I feel it's a dangerous intersection, um, but I haven't. You know, the numbers don't show that. Let's not wait for that, though. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not advocating waiting for I know, it. I mean, I know. But it's. It, you know, we are very cognizant of, yeah. of the challenges at that spot, but I think it is something that you know people are aware of, and it is a challenge because it is challenging. I think people are more aware as they go out. So. You know, versus something that's an easier intersection. Steve, well, did you have? Yeah. This was last discussed when the DOT project was done on Route One, right? And we, there were discussions about uh, changing yeah. or even closing we, that street. We made, you know, the the Andrew Jarvis intersection upgrade right. was the ability to create a safe alternative for vehicles mm -hmm. to come and go instead of going to this location. Yeah. You know, the the thought of the time was that we would look at restricting. One direction of traffic uh, off of this uh, street, and thereby, you know, eliminating the need mm -hmm. for this danger, you know, for at least one direction of this dangerous intersection. Um, that was not received well by the residents, and you know, as a result, the project kind of got put on hold. Um, as, as things often do, when something gets put on hold, other things get higher on the queue. Mm -hmm. So, the, to answer the question, it isn't. It isn't currently in the. It's more like a three-year. Two, two to three year project but the design itself is something that you know we, we talk about on a regular basis saying you know we got to get an engineer on board and start the public process so that you know we can flesh out these challenges because you know there's alternative ways for pedestrians in that neighborhood to go through I, had, I used to have friends that lived there and I know we would there was ways to get in and out of that neighborhood um, but you mean by vehicle pedestrian yeah. Pedestrians? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a path, but if you're pushing a stroller, you can't do that path. You have to go I, up to I the understand. sidewalk. Yeah. So perhaps, I don't think we have a motion yet. Maybe we could have a motion to place on file and, and review again in so moved. three months? Or what would be a good time frame, in your opinion, Peter, just to make sure we catch the school season? I would I would tie it to the, um, well, we would, we'll do additional collection of data, but I would tie the project of that intersection to the CIP. And, and say if the committee wants, uh, feels it necessary, we call it out specifically um, in the CIP as a project, and therefore council can decide when to fund it. Okay. Can I move that we get a report back in a couple months after data is collected, and then we can comment about whether we think it should go? Sure. The the challenge is the CIP process is starting right now. Right. Um, <laughs> so I would recommend. I would think identifying it as a CIP issue would would be the ability to put it as a placeholder in the discussion, and then we can still come back. Easier to take it out. Than to it's put easier it in later. to not fund it in that year, 
<clears throat> and push it out okay. than, to, than to bring it up after the fact. And just a technical question. Do we refer it to the planning board for the CIP, or do we refer it to the council to send to the planning board? Um, you refer it to us to put it into the CIP. Okay. So by, by this vote, we will put it into the CIP. It does not, I mean, residents can put in submissions to, this, to the planning board. Uh, they, they often do, um, you know, as a citizen's request. But typically, uh, something like this, if the committee says, you know, we feel it's something worth looking at, um, staff would just put it into the CIP. Okay. All right. So I guess that would, Mary Lou? Right. Well, there's the uh, flashing lights is one item. The other is reconstruction of the intersection. It would seem to me that if we got more information after school starts, that we could look at the flashing pedestrian lights and then work on the CIP. Sure. It, just, it just seems more immediate than waiting two or three or five years to make it safer for pedestrians. They come up the sidewalk on that east side and they have a, need a place to cross. And there are a lot of families in that neighborhood. I know that. Um, so I, would, I don't want to see this put on file. I would like to see, as uh, Erica suggested, that we bring, bring back more information at the next meeting and work on it from there. Okay. Mark? Just, um, I was just thinking a motion to study after September 1st once school's in session. I don't think we technically have a motion yet, or do so, we? So I'm going to make we've, we've two motions. Because we've gone a lot of directions. A motion and not a second. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, I feel like there's two motions. Yeah. Or one big motion. Right, one which motion. is very difficult for the note taker. Well, I'll say it, and then you, we can decide the logistics of it. I I feel like I want to make a motion to have staff report back once data has been collected in terms of pedestrian activity at that intersection and to put the intersection on the CIP for I, study. I don't know how I, I that would, fits. Mr. Chair, if I could. Yes. I would say don't worry about the second motion. It's, it, well, it'll be in the CIP. Because we talked about it. Because we talked about it. OK. Um, and only one motion will be needed. Okay. Is there a second to it? So I'll the, second Erica's So the actual motion. motion is just to have staff report back once school time data, count data is available. That's, that's seconded. <laughs> she got it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Any you. opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Perseverance, please. <laughs> that was a tricky one. Just keep trying. All right, now we have a lot of informational. Um, a, Pickering Street, Pickering Avenue, Mechanic Street, parking restrictions. Um, my understanding, or do you want to go ahead, Eric? Sure. I can. So we've, um, there's pictures in the packet, this area here, the intersection of Mechanic Street and Pickering Street, where Vehicles are just parked to any spare spot they can find. Uh, but it turns out that in Chapter 7 ordinances, these areas are all no parking. These yellow highlighted areas are no parking currently. But because there are a lack of utility poles in the area in which to put signs, we don't have any signs in the area informing people of these restrictions. Mm. Um, you know, it's a historical area. We don't, we're reluctant to go out and throw up a lot of ugly signposts and signs. We could. Uh, go out there and stencil the words no parking on the pavement and enforce it that way during summer months but in order to make it legal year round you really have to have signs in this area because of snow in the winter time and covering up markings on the street uh, so i just want to bring this to attention that it is something that we can enforce but we do need to at least put no parking on the pavement at this time and then maybe if it's still an issue come back and put sign posts up so, Mr. Chairman, this is an informational item. We have the ordinance in place. Um, it's a matter of it's been brought to our attention by the residents. Uh, so we will be working and we will be po posting signs. Um, so and, and we're going to do that with a blend of painting the pavement as well. OK. And the feedback I've gotten from residents and at least one business is they're all in support because I guess the park yep. has gotten a little out of hand. Yeah, it, it's 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 already this has been looked at in the past. And it's you know, it was one of those things that out of the historic sensitivity, um, we did not want to post a lot of signs, but you know where the residents are requesting it, we will move forward with it. Okay. And then the second informational item is Woodbury Avenue temporary speed cushions update. Yes. Uh, so this is some latest data that we collected on Woodbury with the speed cushions. We're still in place. Um, you know, average speeds are 20, 23 miles per hour in the 85th percentile. So they're definitely having a significant impact on slowing traffic out there. Um, to address Justin's comments, the, yes, the uh, 
speed, you know, some people were coming to a stop before going over, not knowing how fast to go over these. So when we put them out again, which will be at the other end of Woodbury between Echo Ave and Maplewood Ave, we will add some uh, supplemental signs to the speed bump saying 20 miles per hour so people know you can still drive over these at a decent speed. You don't have to come to a complete stop. And uh, they will be the same height, the three inch height, that's a standard height for these uh, speed cushion speed bumps. But we are working with the fire department. We've been out there and had them look at the proposed layout, and we will uh, be adjusting the cushions so that the gaps are more in line with the fire truck's wheels, and they won't have to worry about cars parked. Uh, so we're, we are tweaking them. That's the one advantage to these portable units. We can adjust them, modify them as needed. So we'll be putting those out next Monday is the date for putting them out at the other end of Woodbury Ave. And we'll be monitoring the speeds as well as putting video camera out there to see how drivers are reacting. <laughs> And we'll have you know improved signage, taller, better, advanced signage as well. So, okay. Mark, hey, Eric, um, remind me of the the traffic numbers. It's seven thousand a day that go down that road. Yes, I think we at some see. point are we going to measure to see once? Well, we can do it now, but mm -hmm. maybe later, is to see if people are being deterred driving down that mm -hmm. now. That number is going to go down, or they're going to still be at that seven thousand yeah. number. I would suspect it wouldn't go down much. Uh, you can see on these uh, volumes here, this was about a three-day count. We had twenty-two thousand, so you're still in that seven to eight thousand. <coughs> okay, so they're not being deterred. They're not saying, "Hey, I don't want to go down that street. I'm going to go down this way." Yeah, okay. and we are monitoring uh, the side streets out there too. I believe it's right. meta to see if there's any yeah. traffic being diverted. Okay, and that's happened the same thing with the circle on Bartlett too. Yeah, people that want to avoid it. It's redirecting people elsewhere. Mm -hmm. That's hard to measure because there's so much construction going on. So yeah, all right, um, and perhaps with the new location Monday, we might want to have Monty make some posts about that to let people know that they're they're coming back in a new location. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I don't think we have the viewership uh, that he has. Yeah, that, that will be in the city newsletter. Perfect, Steve. I, I think also in that post, the explanation of why. I don't. I don't know if it was the original plan to put two on one end, take them up, put two on the other end, and then I did hear you say. I think at the last meeting that, you know, conceptually there would be six. I my personal feeling is that's just overkill, and that peop, there will be some point where people will say that's. Too much, but it, was this the plan? Like two on one end, take them up to two. Well, the plan is two parts. The one is the temporary ones that we have now. Yep. We have two yep. sets of them that we're putting out, and the idea was oh, to try to have two various sets. spots along the corridor so that we can see how to gauge working. best impact. Yep. But the overall plan was to put <clears throat> not six. Okay. Eight. <laughs> <laughs> and you might recall, Steve, we had a yeah, just, lot of meetings on this. I know we so did. We had the layout, Put but I guess the, the, that that number. Uh, but, but as you recall, the, the it's shown that it, it, it's not a traffic calming measures aren't effective unless you do it in a regular frequency on a roadway. Mm -hmm. right. So based on the you know design criteria, that is it fell out to be eight, and and the desire of that neighborhood is to slow traffic. And, and so and as that's as how you knew it. As mentioned by Justin, you know, after drivers get through it, they're getting aggressive and trying to make up for that lost time. So when okay. you do have them spaced evenly, do you okay. avoid that behavior? I, I stated my opinion. I, yeah. it, I, I, <laughs> I don't think you're area. incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We'll see how the reaction goes. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I'm, I'm curious continuing about Continuing on with the Aldrich Road speed bumps update. Yes. Uh, Aldrich Road, we have marked out. Oh, it's not this diagram, but... Um, Aldrich Road, we have gone out and spray painted the locations where we will be placing two more speed bumps. One is uh, down between Sewell Road and Islington Street, and the second location is on the curve, just um, between Sewell and I think it's Joffrey Terrace. So if you, those will be constructed out of asphalt. They will not be temporary ones. They will be permanent, and that will be happening uh, later this year. Okay. Are you getting any feedback from the neighbors where you painted, where you marked it? Uh, Any I, concerns or thoughts? No, I have spoken with a couple of neighbors, and, and they're okay. And they're with aware it? of where they are, and they did not express any displeasure. I did when we were marking them out. We did hear from someone who was walking their dog, who lives down near the existing one at Boss Ave, and was not thrilled that there was going to be more, because oh. she complained she does not like the noise that's created by trailers and trucks going over them. Okay, so the decision has been made. They're permanent instead of speed cushions. They're going to be. Yes. Speed tables. Speed tables, yes. Yeah. The 
because of the width of the road, the speed cushions really wouldn't work. They, it's just got to be a solid. Uh, there will be drainage on the ends, but so not in two the or just one. Two more, yes. Can you stagger it at all? Can you put one in and six months, maybe in the spring, put another one? Or is, I, that, I would, or is that controversial? I, I would suggest not doing that. The expectation is two of them are going to be put okay. in. It's public statements have been made. Okay. Uh, monies have been set aside. Um, I would. And we've I would, had a lot of people show up. I would up. not I uh, recommend staggering it. Let's yeah. Just take care of it. Okay. I just what I'm hearing from the public, like, like you just said, uh, Andrew. So. All right. Now, continuing with speed bumps, uh, Suzanne Drive speed bump update. Yes, the uh, speed bumps were installed, the permanent ones with asphalt on Suzanne Drive. One was at the entrance off of Route 1, and one was about halfway into the neighborhood. And what we've spe seen is the speeds have gone down slightly from 17 miles an hour to 15 miles an hour. Uh, what we haven't collected yet is the amount of cut-through traffic. That's what, something we'll be monitoring with cameras and to see if this is deterring people from using the neighborhood as a cut-through between Route 1 and Ocean Road. So. Could you go back up just for a second? Okay, thanks. All right, moving on, the Middle Road Traffic Calming Program update. Uh, this is just to, to bring attention to the fact that, you know, the speed limit on Middle Road has been lowered and uh, it's been made permanent and it's going through a council process right now to make that as part of Chapter 7 ordinance. So there won't be any more additional traffic calming measures that this time. Uh, you know, anything else would be a, a more long-term capital improvement program, such as sidewalks or you know, road reconstruction, like, like in that matter. Um, the speed signs were removed because we do have a backlog of requests around the city to to for the signs. They had been out there for five years on Middle Road. Uh, we can look at putting them back when we have opportunity, when we get through our backlog of cases that we have, or we can acquire more signs, we can put them out there again in the future. Okay. It, it's also uh, good data to collect relative to, you know, if, if changing speed limits alone uh, influence behavior. Um, this helps uh, reinforce that, you know, a combination of activities are needed in order to, to be able to achieve uh, lower speeds. So I think there's good data that's collected as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Mary Lou? Yes, I think as long as we, the city, has been um, putting up our FBs, there have been more and more requests. And I think they are effective, and I certainly think that on Middle Road. Um, you know, you could go in or out on Middle Road and you see braking as soon as they see those flashing lights. I see it on South Street. We have three on South Street, and it's really significant how those flashing lights affect the speed of, of traffic. It's interesting that four of our informational uh, subjects are all on so speed. These were speed limit signs, if I understand. Yeah, I'm, I'm going oh. back. I'm going back to uh, Lisa Hewitt's comment about the our FBs being removed. No, no we didn't no, take no, those away. We took away the speed feedback, feedback signs, signs have been removed. because we need them elsewhere. Wait a minute. We Say didn't that. take away any RFBs. No, no. Those are still From there. Middle? Yeah, they're no, there. they're still there. You took down the you're speed limit sign that tells you how sign, fast you're going. The speed limit sign versus the flashing. It. I'm talking about the flashing lights. Yeah, they're still there. Yeah. The so you're confusing. The RRFB is the pedestrian flashing light. Those are still there. The speed sign, speed indicator, which does flash, is not there. That's right. Correct. That's what I'm referring to. Well, you, I'm sorry. You're, I'm you're using the wrong terms. terms. Oh, okay. <laughs> term, but uh, I'm talking about the flashing speed limit signs. Okay. Yeah. Um, that I think should be replaced on Middle Road. Oh. And, and I'm I think talking about the fact that those are on South Street. There are three of them on South Street. They make a huge difference, you know that, um, in the speed. So I'm sorry, I've used the wrong term. Oh, that would cause a little confusion. What we can do is why don't we collect, or I don't know if we need to do this at a future meeting, but we could collect the speed data and see if there's been an increase since the signs were removed. That staff has is, is been directed to do that. Okay. Um, and. You know, our plan is to put permanent speed signs back up, but we have to budget for that and get it done. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, the portable ones are intended to be rotated around the city. So, well, the issue is how much we, they cost. We, yep. we yep. understand, you know, yep. the, so I, I understand. And it's part of the overall cost, program. I'd like to see Mark them in budget and then so Steve. Okay. Uh, Chief Maloney, can you just remind me of the psychology behind these? these lights. So I remember you stating before that you put them up 
it changes behavior, you take them down, they go right back to, can you remind us of the psychology behind the purpose of these flashing? I think it's pretty simple. The, the speed limit sign indicates the speed limit, and if you're exceeding it, um, these uh, display signs will show you that, and the instinct is to <laughs> slow down when you see it. It's supposed to be a behavioral modification tool, right? But if you take sure, it down... I, yeah, I mean, it's meant to slow drivers. Okay. Yeah, you can call it whatever you like, but... Um, but once you take it down, there's a period well, we're of time... we're going to evaluate. I think you'd have to study So, uh, Steve? I, I, I just think that we should encourage the budgeting of funds to, for permanent dynamic speed signs. I think they're effective. I think they're cost-effective. I think they're less uh, less negative feedback than speed tables, temporary or permanent, and yeah. I really think they should be judiciously used as part of our permanent traffic control landscape, and I think they're a good investment. So that's I, I just want to reiterate, the intent of this informational mm -hmm. item was to say that a, a pilot was done on Middle Road, mm -hmm. information was gathered, and, and strategies were settled on in terms of yep. this interim until we do a major reconstruction of the roadway. Those strategies included the reduction of speed, the speed limit, and the inclusion of, of the speed signs, speed variable, what do we call it, the dynamic variable speed. dynamic speed indicators. <laughs> um, they, they, will, they are part of the overall program. The ones that were there now were relocated for a reason because people are asking for them. We have limited resources to be mm -hmm. able to cover that. Yep. So the intent is just to say the pilot's done. Got it. And we are, until we do something more um, significant to, this, to the roadway, you know, that, that is where we're at. Erica? Sorry. I'm just, I, I have a call at 10, so I'm, like, keen to finish. But um, I, I feel like as long as I've been on PTS, we've been talking about speeds on Middle Road, and there's this, like, idea of having a capital improvement project to make changes on Middle Road. I, I guess this is a question again on time frame. Do we have a time frame of when we might make more permanent changes? There is, this money is identified in the CIP for a bicycle pedestrian quarter okay. along that. I can't remember what the date of that was. I think it's an, an out year. Okay. Um, but there's, we don't feel at this point there's a real clear um, consensus about, you know, what needs to be done moving forward. Um, you know, I, you know, there's, there's, to me, the gateway is where we have to regulate the speed. It's that the Peverly Hill, mm. where Peverly Hill and Middle Road come together, there needs to be a hard stop at that location and difficult to gather speed up after that because people are coming off the highway. I'm guilty of this myself. You know, you've been driving 60 miles an hour, and then all of a sudden you get onto this relatively wide street and it, it's wow. straight and it, about it, that. Gives you, <laughs> um, it gives you a visual uh, yeah. cue to say it's okay to go fast yeah yeah and until we do something uh, to change that it's okay. it's, it's going to be hard to regulate just with speed signage and um, it, but that's just the nature of, of, of traffic yeah okay All right. thanks um, moving on from that one uh, the monthly accident report from police Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so for the month of June, we had a total of 89 crashes that included uh, minor crashes and serious crashes. Um, when I say a serious crash, I would put that in the category of a reportable, uh, state reportable uh, crash, and we had uh, 53 of those. Uh, we have seen um, a fairly significant increase in, in crashes in July and June. Uh, not one, any, not one, any, uh, not any one contributing factor are we seeing that are causing them. Um, could be a combination of increased vehicle traffic, increased pedestrian traffic, and overall summer activities. Um, we have had a number of crashes with serious bodily injury. We had a crash earlier this week uh, where somebody was killed. Um, so we are seeing an impact. We are closely monitoring it. And um, again, if if I do come across these crashes where I think road design or a topic relative to PTS um, would be brought here, I'm always mindful to do that. Um, with respect to 
flashing speed limit signs. Some of you may notice um, with the police department acquired a new uh, a new speed limit sign that we've deployed on uh, Market Street Extension, and right now it is out on Sagamore Ave facing outbound traffic um, near the cemetery. It's a big, it's a small trailer, uh, LED illuminated uh, speed limit sign, and when you exceed the speed limit, it actually has blue lights that light up, uh, which is kind of neat. And at night, it actually looks like a cruiser pulling somebody over. So, <laughs> yeah. um, like um, Director I said. Um, these are in high demand. So, I mean, virtually, if you live on a street in Portsmouth, you want one of these signs. So, uh, we try to do our best to accommodate it and put it in areas where, where we think it can be uh, of assistance. But, um, but everybody, everybody wants one, and we try to do our best to, to hit the areas that we, we see it the most. And it is solar generated, so when you see it out for about a week, maybe a week and a half, um, depending on the weather, it can last a week, a week and a half, 10 days. But if the uh, solar panels don't uh, recharge the batteries, we do have to take it in for a weekend and recharge it. But uh, they're, they're certainly a good thing to have. I watched the one on Sagamore Ave uh, yesterday, um, and they're effective, particularly when you see blue lights. You don't usually see the blue lights flash. Uh, so this is the first one we've had that had the blue lights. So it's, it's kind of neat. And when blue lights pop out of nowhere and start flashing, you're hard-pressed to not slow down. Yeah. So, uh, so that's good. That's and good. Mr. Chairman, if... Could I comment on the? Um, yes. Could I make it just an enforcement notification yes, on that? So, um, Pierce Island right now is closed to uh, overnight activity, excluding fishing and boat launching, which you can do 24 hours a day. So, um, the regulations right now are sunrise to 11 p.m. Sunrise right now is at about 5:30 p.m. These photographs were taken allegedly at about 7:30 a.m., but it looks like way by the shadowing on the trees. So I don't know if these vehicles were here overnight. They could have been there starting at 5.30 when the sun rose. I probably doubt they were not. Um, so I have a note, and I'm going to follow up on, uh, on the overnight enforcement of this after, uh, after 11 p.m. because it changes during the summer and fall hours. But um, I'm, I'm going to pass this on that this is what we're seeing out there. And if people are camping there after 11 p.m., they don't have a fishing pole or a boat in their hand um, that will move them along. That said, do keep in mind it's probably going to displace them to Paradav or, you know, kind of do so that. But. Just, to, just to add to, to uh, Deputy Chief's comment, um, so I've been working with the legal department, and as of this morning, they reached out to me saying that they have ordinance saying they can restrict camping on the island. Um, so what we're going to be doing is posting a sign at the beginning of the island saying no overnight camping on Pierce Island. Um, Great. So it'll be it'll be really clear, and as you enter the onto the bridge, um, it'll it won't say dawn to dusk. It just say you no camping. Great. Okay. Yeah, and that's I had somebody text me the picture of the sign while we were here, so that's yeah, what I was just yeah, yeah. reviewing it. So yep. all that'll make it easy. I think that's going to accelerate the issue when everybody moves into the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It might. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. yes, all sir. right. Oh, um, I was just going to move on to the downtown parking utilization study update. Or did you have something for the previous item? I can just do it during open. Go ahead. Okay. And is there uh, a presentation, or is I, it just I, more I, of I an guess awareness we'll do that, item? Mr. Chairman, I mean uh, the uh, parking director um, Ben Fletcher and myself, uh, are, and, and Eric, as well as Tyler, and I know you're on the committee, and Steve, or not the committee, the working group, and, and Steve's on the working group. Uh, the intent was just to point out that there is a, a utilization study going on. It includes information relative to zoning um, requirements um, as well, and there's a link uh, shown on the um, agenda that can get you to some of the information. Uh, there will be a public meeting once uh, the working group has developed uh, some recommendations, um, but uh, at this point it's an, in, an internal process, uh, but there are uh, folks that are involved. Um, to help uh, provide guidance and, and uh, input from outside of just staff. All right, now I'll just reiterate what Peter said, that it's a comprehensive evaluation of parking, not just paid parking. Yes. All right, uh, miscellaneous. I think, yes, miscellaneous. Mark? Chief Maloney, I was just going to ask you an open question. So you go down to Prescott Park, with a, a patrolman goes down there, it's after 11 o'clock, he redirects them. They're going to say, if I'm a camper, I'm going to say, well, where do you want me to go? It's a, you mean Pierce Island? Yeah. Right? Right. Pierce Island? Right, correct. 
So, so I'm a camper. I'm on pure side. It's 11 o'clock at night. Uh, patrol officer knocks on the door. I have to move. Mm -hmm. But where does your officer? I'm going to say, well, where do I go? Any place where it's not prohibited. It's not our responsibility to tell you yeah. where you should go. Okay. You're in the camper. Yeah, they're going to ask that. They're going <laughs> to ask that. Hotel, hotel perhaps? Kittery. <laughs> yeah, hotel. yeah, Kittery. <laughs> Third Avenue. Walmart. Well, no, they don't allow it. Allow well, it. no. They don't allow it anymore. No, listen, well, they don't allow it, but on, on Route 1, they're there. So they don't allow. But they're there. But they're there. There are no signs restricting them. No, there's no but, signs restricting them. I, I think we I, want to let them stay we there. Can't <laughs> anyway. But we can't promote that as a city. Right. right. Go to Walmart. You can't do that. Yeah. And, and, well, as you know, it's a larger topic. And yeah. It sure yeah. is. It's brought I up just, a couple yes. times. I was just curious. Just Kate wanna... Cook is working on this, correct? Yes. And I think Erica has another mistake. I had a small question. Do you think, I really appreciate the way you send out the packet with the meeting appointment and our email. Could we just get a link to that instead of the attachment? I feel like the attachment is yes. filling up my inbox oh. at a surprisingly quick rate. Maybe I already had to fill it. <laughs> Not a lot of capacity, but I feel like, isn't that the same one that we post on the yeah, web? Yeah, I can do that. Would that be a problem for anyone if it was a link instead of an attachment? that okay? Mm -hmm. That would help me a lot. <laughs> okay. All right. Seeing no more miscellaneous, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.